Scholar Seminar series, as most of you in this room have already heard, but I always need to do this spiel a little bit to introduce the series. This is our seminar series that is designed to bring in physicians who are practicing but who are also doing research. The idea of showing you guys role models and examples of how um, this crazy world of biomedical research can operate. And so I think you're going to hear some interesting um, stories from Dr. Cotton about how he collaborates both with PhDs and MDs to do the kind of research that he's doing. But before we hear from him, we're going to get a brief introduction of him from Dr. Brian Collier. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, basketball season's coming up, so I hope you guys are. Uh, <laughs> for the medical season, I think there's been six or seven years in a row that you've lost, so I, I recommend. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Anyway, so Dr. Cotton and I um, actually practiced together for a period of time at Vanderbilt. And, uh, other than all the wonderful information that he's going to provide you, I want you to put this in context. So he is absolutely a practicing uh, uh, physician, takes care of patients, etc. And what he started to do at Vanderbilt was come up with a concept of, as you will, as you will learn uh, very quickly, massive transfusion coagulopathy. And he took it to the bedside and said, this is how we're going to practice. I'm going to make a little committee. I'm going to form a way to do it better. I'm going to study before. I'm going to study after. I'm going to, again, show up to those committee meetings every week, every month. I'm going to see how the process could, uh, becomes better and better. And suddenly, you form this little niche around you that um, you're doing things that are great. And suddenly, you're known at Vanderbilt as the expert at Massive Transfusion Protocol. Uh, you know, fast forward 10 years, you go to another institution, you keep doing work. And lo and behold, you become one of the national leaders at Massive Transfusion Protocol and Coagulopathy. And now he gets an opportunity to, to fly around the world as the world expert. So outside of the information he gives you, I want you to put in perspective is what is something that you absolutely love or sometimes fall into, and you practice it and you look around the patients that you see and go, what is going on numerous times with these patients that I can study? And you start with one patient, five patients, 10 patients, and then suddenly you have a practice that has two to 4,000 patients a year. You fast forward five years and suddenly you have 25,000 patients and that's how you can um, move the needle and push it in longer. So um, without further ado, Dr. Cotton, come on up, share some information. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so this, again, I'm not like, like he introduced and, 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 and your mentor introduced I'm not necessarily a traditional researcher. Uh, in fact, we talked in our small group, uh, my epiphany uh, of going into trauma even as a field was uh, the Branch Davidian shootout in Waco when I was an undergrad at Baylor. It inspired me and made me lock in hard focus to go do trauma surgery. And, and I actually st st stuck, st you know, stuck with it. I would say that I went to my first fellowship actually with zero interest in research. Uh, my plan was to go and be at a busy uh, trauma center maybe in Fort Worth back in my hometown that wasn't necessarily even an academic training program. My two years at Penn transformed me into somebody that, and again I will go ahead and just admit, um, I was too average uh, uh, to get into medical school. Uh, the traditional route, I was rejected from every medical school in the United States twice. I went to the Caribbean for med school because I was hard uh, and determined to get into medical school. And so I went down there and proved myself and was fortunate enough to take tests well, blew the USMLE away and got into a university academic uh, residency, but still had no interest in doing it. And when I went to Penn, constantly having to prove myself, partly real, partly perceived because I had an enormous a chip on my shoulder that Dr. Collier can probably still see to this day, uh, to prove myself as being as good because I had to go to the Caribbean. And so there was a lot of issues with that. And Penn showed me the way to produce and prove myself and to support what I was believing in. Even though I thought it was the right thing to do, did I have data? Did I have science? Could I prove it in a real world setting versus just anecdote? Because again, as I was constantly reminded, and it often comes out of my mouth, and definitely from Oscar Gilliam and Daigie, who was one of our faculty, uh, the plural of anecdote is not data. So I got a chance to kind of really prove myself and push things forward. Um, and so I want to give you, this is, this is not just the last decade of all research. I'm going to try to be inclusive and talk about other people's research. 
but for the, I want you to imagine this is Forrest Gump goes to trauma resuscitation. So I'm gonna give you almost a Forrest Gump where he's always like, you know, he's having a Dr. Pepper and shaking LBJ's hand and then he's, or JFK and then the other room he's getting an award from LBJ or something like that. This is kind of me as Forrest Gump going through trauma resuscitation over the last 10 well blow them up like the michelin man so in 1998 there was an f3 tornado that came through columbia missouri uh and it devastated uh the community not only did it do that but it injured a lot of people now the newspapers reported in fact i got this off of wikipedia because i was trying to find out the exact date that it occurred they recorded zero deaths i've highlighted and underlined that zero deaths because it's only partially true the tornado Technically killed zero people, but there was one death that night and the murderer was me. And I'm going to tell you why. 11 10, 98, multiple casualties arrived by this tornado. The attending and the chief resident were both in the operating theater. The ICU attending, which was the backup for the OR attending, came in from home and the senior resident was in the operating room. I was alone, second year, just starting my second year of residency, all alone in the ICU. A 20-year-old female came in from this tornado, severe traumatic brain injury, long bone injuries, and pelvic fractures. So I did what we did back then. I gave fluids, and then I gave her more fluids, and then I put an arterial line in to measure her blood pressure, and then I gave her some more fluids, and I gave her some more fluids. She's still doing crappy. What am I going to do? So I put a swan gans or a PA, pulmonary artery catheter, in her, and I gave her some more fluids. And then I started epinephrine and norepinephrine. And then I gave her some more fluids. And then I finally started giving her blood. Way, way, liters and liters later, finally started giving her blood products. And the blood products I gave her were just red cells. They weren't all the other stuff. So over the next 10 hours, she got 18 liters of fluid from me. Now, I will tell you that that was not horribly crazy abnormal, which we just described at the time. Now it seems insane. And she got numerous blood products, late blood products, no platelets. Uh, some plasma and escalating doses of those adrenaline and noradrenaline. I missed her abdominal compartment syndrome, which was similar to that case of the bowels busting out. And when that happens, there's low flow back to the heart and you die. So she continued to get worse. And finally, the chief resident got out of the OR and swung in to 
save her and figured she had abdominal compartment syndrome, took her, took care of her abdomen, opened her up. She had bowels that looked like that. But then she progressed to brain death and organ donation. And so that stuck with me forever. Even though they told me, well, you missed the abdominal compartment syndrome, but we would have given that much fluid too. It's fine. But I didn't feel right about it. Fast forward a few years, I'm the chief resident at the VA. And at the VA in 2002, the chief resident in surgery was five years in training, and you ran the show. You truly ran the show. There was a good and there was a bad about that. You ran it. You ran that show. You were the CMO, CFO. You were running that shop, and it was fantastic as a chief resident because you were outranked all the medicine residents because they only did a three-year residency, and you were there for five years. And I read this article because this was before Twitter and before social media. I was signed up for something called Eureka Alert. And what it did is it scoured all the journals that were coming out, and it sent you alerts of the table of contents for all these journals. Now you just sign up for it. It dumps into my Gmail, and I have them on every day. And in fact, I probably have 15 or 20 sitting over there right now from journals that I get sent. I saw this, though, read it out of the Lancet, about fluid balance. And I looked at this, and it was 10 patients were given the standard group, the normal fluids that we give post-op patients, peri-op patients, and then a group that where they restricted it. And they got a couple of liters less a day. The other ones weren't getting like 18 liters, but they were getting several liters, and the other ones were getting about a liter to two liters a day. And by just restricting that in a sample size of 10 in each group, which ain't a lot, they were able to see a difference in gastric emptying by nuclear medicine scans, by first flatus, by first bowel movement, by tolerating PO, and by length of stay. And this caught me. So for my last three months at the VA, I started practicing this based on what I had seen. So all my elective VA cases, they were getting saline locked, which means I was cutting their fluids off as soon as they came out of the OR. They're on this maintenance stuff until they can tolerate a diet. I'm getting rid of their fluids. In fact, once they start to mobilize their fluids and, and it looks like they're getting a little bit wet on their lungs, I'm going to give them a diuretic, Lasix. I'm going to make them pee, get this off. And anecdotally, I didn't record it. I wasn't smart enough to put all on an Excel sheet and actually record this stuff. They seemed to do better. They seemed to do better, and they left quicker. And so I was already inspired that this was the right way to go things, and this was even an elective. Fast forward 2002, 2004, I went to the University of Pennsylvania for my fellowship, and this was a lot of the way we practiced. So Pennsylvania, or Philly, sorry, uh, a lot of the uh, penetrating or trauma we saw was penetrating. And so a lot of what their thoughts were, even though they still gave a lot of fluids to, to patients as well, they gave a lot less to the penetrating trauma. And this is one of the key articles that came out from Maddox. And it was called the Maddox study or the Houston study. It's our Baylor colleagues next door at Ben Todd that did it. And they looked at about 300 patients in each group. And what they said is, you're going to get no IV fluids, even though you're a bleeding to death trauma patient, your blood pressure is low, you've been shot, we're not going to give you any fluids until you get to the operating room. So that means all the way drive in the ambulance in Houston, go to the ER, get a quick workup, and go upstairs, no fluids. Or you get the standard fluid, a liter in the field, maybe another liter or two in the bay, and then you go to the OR. And what they found was that the patients arrived with better blood, with, with a lower blood pressure, which we'll talk about later, permissive hypotension, lower blood pressure, but their coags were actually better. Their clotting time was actually improved. Then they went upstairs, and they... It, by the time they got upstairs, they'd gotten almost uh, two and a half liters of fluid in the standard group, which was about normal, or they had gotten just under about 400 cc's uh, in, in the other group. So a lot less fluid uh, by design in the randomized trial. The important part is they had less bleeding in the operating room, 30% blood volume loss in the standard group, 23% in the, in the restricted group, and guess what? higher survival. 70% of patients were able to leave the hospital versus only 62%. So this inspired me and this inspired a lot of penetrating trauma patients. This is me in the bumblebee cap because I love that as a surgical cap because just, just a little bee sting. That's all you're going to feel. And of course I do trauma which you're going to get a little more of a bee sting. So then 2004 I moved to Nashville to Vanderbilt University Medical Center, which is where I met Dr. Collier. He was a second year fellow at the time, so I was literally about a year ahead of him. I had just finished my second year and moved to Vanderbilt. And I went there with zero interest in resuscitation research. The only thing I wanted to do was not take care of confused old people in the ICU. I was so sick of it. And so I wanted to stomp out delirium. I wanted to stop it. And one of the people things that sealed the deal for me to go to Vanderbilt was that Wes Ely, who pioneered medical ICU delirium research, was there. And I wanted to work with him 
to work in the surgical ICU and stop these confu confused people in my ICU so I could take care of them when they're fixed, they can go out and go home. I'm total surgeon mentality. Get them out of here. I don't want to deal with them. I don't want this confused old person in my unit. No interest in resuscitation. And then things changed. I was met with a lot of fluid. I was met with abdomens that look like that. 10 out of the 14 beds look like that when I showed up. Now, not that, that's the most dramatic one, but 10 out of the 14 had their abdomens open in the ICU because they couldn't get them closed. And I was told, you got to swell to get well, Brian. You have to swell to get well. And I, that was, it was the Billy Madison moment. If you guys have seen that, what you just said is the most insanely idiotic thing I've ever heard. <laughs> we are all now dumber for having listened to it. That, that game show moment. That was the, I didn't say that out loud, but I was thinking it. I was like, that's horrible. And they're like, oh, that's penetrating trauma is different, Brian. That's, that's Philly. That's penetrating. Blunt has to swell to get well. This is what we look like when we were resuscitating them. <laughs> and that's what their bowels look like when they woke up. And this, then they'd get all horrible. And this is the picture I was talking about yesterday at dinner. They would go and not be able to tolerate feeding. Because if you think you can absorb anything when your bowel looks like that, you can't. And I, there's... The only thing I hate close to that much fluids is TPN, which is a, a IV form of nutrition. And so this is me throwing away a bag of a very expensive TPN, which got me a little in trouble. Um, so w what's going on? Why, why, what could we possibly be thinking? So let's go back a bit. I'm going to pull in my Star Wars geekiness here uh, with a little bit of this slide. But how the heck did we get to this point? There's a reason. There, I understand why some very smart people did some very dumb things. And here's why. Shires was one of, the, one of the giants in resuscitation that came out in the 60s, and he was promoting the concept of third space, where surgical and trauma patients, patients bleeding to death, their capillaries get leaky and the fluids go out into the cells, and you've got to replace that during these acute traumas, acute surgeries. You have not just the regular fluids, their maintenance fluids, they need a little bit extra, this third space loss. Then, Franny Moore said, no, 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 my lab showed just the opposite. My lab showed that you actually still retain some, so you should probably actually give less fluid, and that third space is all BS. That was Franny's argument. Well, they went back and forth, back and forth, and definitely on the national stage, Shires was winning the, the argument, even though these were all animal models. Not to say the animal models aren't good, but that they hadn't shown this in humans yet. And so the two of them came together, believe it or not, and did a handshake in an editorial of the Annals of Surgery, which is the highest ranking surgical journal, and said, a plea for moderation. And they actually called the article a plea for moderation. That was the, their commentary editorial. But it was very much ignored. It was very much ignored, blown off, and they continued this hyper-normal resuscitation. Lots of fluids. They listened to Shires, ignored Franny Moore, and kept moving. And then about that time, Shoemaker comes out with this Darwinian challenge, I would call it, where we're going to ramp up and give you so much fluid. If you survive this assault, we're, then you get to live. If you don't, eh, you're going to die. I, I'm oversimplifying it and doing a little tongue-in-cheek there, obviously. But what he was doing was trying to drive up oxygen delivery to the cells by giving so much fluid and being these invasive catheters and crazy lines that made sense from a research standpoint, but harmed patients. So that's going on. And all of a sudden, we start hear, seeing this coagulopathy, this bleeding that wasn't happening as much before. And it's starting to happen, uh, and this lethal coagulopathy, they start leaving patients' abdomens open because they're still actively bleeding. They're having to pack things off. Let's go take them to the ICU, warm them up, get their coags corrected. We'll come back uh, the next day. We stopped, started ignoring heart rate, blood pressure, urine output, looking at these basic physiologic things, and, and started getting rid of all the basic principles of hemorrhagic shock resuscitation. And you as a medic, I know that you probably did the ATLS or PHTLS or things like that, and the different phases of hemorrhagic shock. We ignored EBL, heart rate, blood pressure, urine output, and started looking at anion gap, base excess, lactate, which are still important. I'm not poo-pooing them. They are important. But we looked at them and go, we have to fix it. We have to correct them and make them perfect which was wrong. And guess what? We had some pretty good weapons, like a PA catheter, and some bad fluids to make it happen. In fact, we took one of the studies, 76 trauma patients. You have a statistician that's probably going to be seizing here in a moment with some of these results that, <laughs> that said, all right, if you clear your lactate in 24 hours, 100% survival. If you don't, in 48, 14% survival. So what they found was this. 
Among non-survivors, 40% still cleared their lactate. Among non-survivors. Among survivors, 30% left the hospital with never achieving their lactate clearance. They still had an elevated lactate. What they said was, and I quote, time needed to normalize serum lactate levels is an important prognostic factor for survival in severely injured patients. It's a prognostic factor. That's what they said. What we heard was, we got to clear the lactate. We got to clear the lactate in 24 hours or they're going to die. And so we cleared their lactate or tried and they died. And they look like this if they didn't die. At the same time, damage control laparotomy is coming out. We're going to leave them open. We're going to pack them open, stop the bleeding, stop the stool spillage in the abdomen after these gunshot wounds, pack things off, we'll come back later. Then we took them back to take them back, and we couldn't close them because they were so swollen, like that bowel I showed you. You couldn't get them closed. Ah, that's okay. We'll keep going. We'll fix something. We actually came up with surgeons a world congress for abdominal compartment syndrome. It's still an international society, albeit waning. That's like, it's a complication conference. Rather than saying, oh, we're doing something wrong here, let's, let's get together still and let's figure out how to fix it. They were like, let's figure out how to address the complications, not get back to the source. They were coming up with giant abdominal wall reconstruction meshes and things like that. And it started creeping out into other things. So this is an important paper because even though it's just a case report, the year is important, 2006, because 2006 is getting ready to be important here in just a second. In 2006, this paper came out, and it was, a, it was albeit burn resuscitation. They were still killing them with burn fluids at the time. And they said, hey, if you've got a really, really swollen eyeballs, your eyes are popping out of your skull because we've given you so much fluid. We've got a solution for you. You look like this, we're, you're going to do a lateral canthotomy. You're going to release the muscle on the eyeball so that swelling goes away and you don't lose the eyeball. Insane, right? Insane. So that's the insanity It was 2006. This is a slide. This is literally the slide with a different background that I cut and pasted from my grand, Vanderbilt Grand Rounds as a first year faculty. And I said, put all the crystal in the bag and nobody gets hurt. Of course, trash bag. That was my, the title of my talk. I was asked by my, my chairman to give a talk on something and that was his new faculty. That's what we did. Didn't go over so well. So 12304, that was the date of grand rounds. Okay. Delivered to a full department faculty, three sizes the size, three times the size of this room. All four senior faculty, and again, Collier probably doesn't remember it because he was probably working taking trauma call as a busy young guy. All four senior faculty got up and walked out of my talk. And they didn't get paged out, they didn't rush to the operating room. It was noticeable and deliberate. At the end of the available audience, one person stood up and led an applause, and the other one took me under his theoretical mentor wing. The person that got up and led the applause was Dan Beecham, who was the giant chief of the entire, anything that said the word uh, surgery in it, everything but optho, ortho, and OB. The other one is Najia Boomerad, who truly took me on his wing and salvaged my career as well as allowed me to stay five years because I guarantee you I was being pushed out within two years from my division because I, one of these things was not like the other. All right. And he took me under his wing and said, we're going to take that grand rounds because that was fantastic science you presented and we're going to make it a paper and we're going to put it in shock. I don't know what you guys know about shock, but shock is an incredibly basic science journal. It is a fantastic journal. They put clinical relevant stuff in it, but it's for the most part very basic science. I read it just to get in ideas and to get inspired, and I referenced the hell out of it for my grand rounds because it had a lot of the basic science of why fluid was bad. And so he and I put this together. I've got a premature uh, son in the, in, the, in the NICU at that time. I am now feeling I'm getting ready to get fired, I'm pretty sure. And he pulls me in the office and goes, hey, we're going to write a paper in shock. We're going to publish it. It was the best thing he could have done. At the time, I thought he was a maniac. And, it, and he told me, Brian, and I'm, forgive my Lebanese attempt at don't write me up or hashtag me, but Brian, your career is here. It is going to do this after this paper comes out. And I'm like, you're crazy, but you're going to keep me from getting fired, so I don't care. I've got a wife and now three children. OK. So I write it, put it together, take it to him. And he goes, this is great, but we should put some other people on here. Who do you want to put on here? And I'm like, you got to understand, I'm an island. Nobody believes me, or they're, if they do, they're quiet and they're, they're hiding to save their, their careers. I'm not, I can't put one of my partners on here. 
And he goes, I think you should put John Morris. Well, John Morris was truly by, you know, Dr. Evil to my career, and or he was at least the opposite. He was a complete opposite political party from an intellectual standpoint about this, this concept. I go, fine, I'll put him on it, but then I get to put somebody I want on it. So I thought to myself, it took me about 15 seconds, who do they hate more than me? <laughs> they hate Jeff Guy, <laughs> who was one of the burn surgeons, very outspoken guy, very successful, very smart guy, but he, he had timeouts more than I did, if, you know, if that's possible. So we put this on, and the rest truly is history. Uh, here's what happened about that time. So again, 2006, this paper's coming out. 2006, the intraorbital eye-popping stuff is coming out. What the hell are we doing? And the, people aren't seeing it. The military puts together this multidisciplinary. There are anesthesiologists on here, hematologists, pathologists, blood bankers, surgeons, ER doctors, everyone, basic scientists are on this paper. And they said, we got to take care of these people better. These are military injuries they're talking about right now. And as I talked about at Grand Rounds today, the only winner in war, and I, it's not my quote, this is a quote, but I don't know the reference, the only winner in war is medicine, is a famous quote. People die on both sides. There's horrible, horrible things that happen on both sides of a war. The only persons that come around globally is the world of medicine. And so we made a lot of improvement there. Permissive hypotension, limiting that clear fluid, and getting back more to a whole blood-based resuscitation, and they called it damage control resuscitation. Well, flip to the, you know, how are you gonna pull that off? Well, one of the ways you can pull that off is with a massive transfusion protocol, maybe whole blood, which wasn't available at the time, viscoelastic testing, and then other adjuncts to make things happen, to get that whole DCR concept to work. Well, I started with the low-hanging fruit, or what I could possibly do, which is massive transfusion protocols. In other words, protocolizing, laying out, mapping exactly A to B to C how you're going to run a resuscitation of somebody bleeding to death. So, and I had this top secret thing there, kind of in tongue in cheek, but I, I was shot down by my, my leadership of, at Vanderbilt about doing resuscitation and doing a mass transfusion protocol. So, I quietly joined the transfusion committee and I sat in back and I waited for my moment to raise my hand to offer an idea of something to do. And I did that, and we developed the Massive Transfusion Protocol. This is what it was at Vanderbilt. You'll see it's a little different than one we're practicing now. It was 10 units of red cells, six of plasma, two apheresis. And it was a simple phone call. You made the call and said, hey, it's Dr. Cotton, I'm going to OR3. Uh, I'm activating on STAT uh, Zulu. And you, that's it, hung up, and blood just started coming. And it just started coming. And it came until you said, stop, they died, or stop, I got them to stop bleeding and they're okay. Either one of those was the only reason it stopped. It just kept on coming. And it worked pretty impressive. And these are some of the individuals that helped me. One of the ones that we talked about in our small group, this is one of the guys I ended up giving just shy of 10 presentations and research papers to when he applied to orthopedic surgery. I groomed him to be a trauma surgeon, general, do general surgery, and he went to ortho. But he, he, he's a fantastic ortho trauma guy now. The other one is one of our fellows, Oliver Gunter. We worked together on weekends at my house, away from the campus, not to get in trouble. We had dueling computers. I was remote accessed, putting stuff into Excel and pulling stuff up on the EMR and populating this data set that became the study. And the final one is Pompey Young. Interesting story that I talked about earlier, she starts out as a pathologist with interest in stem cell research to uh, work on heart disease and cancer. She hits the door, she's the lowest on the totem pole. And they're all like picking who's, the, who's gonna be the new blood banker. Let's make her do it. She's the newest, she's the youngest, let's send her. So now she goes over there reluctantly, runs the blood bank, we cooperate, we collaborate for a decade, and now she is now the medical director, the head person in charge at the American Red Cross. So this is our paper, this is what we did, and we were excited. We called it damage control hematology, not knowing that the military was simultaneously calling damage control resuscitation at the time, uh, and came up with this concept. Interestingly, we improved survival, and we were so excited to have our survival improved. Now, I want you to put something in reference here. We went from a mortality of almost 66% for massive transfusion patients in 2006 to post MTP down to 51% and we were so excited. I want you to put that in your brain, 65 down to 51%. Anybody know what it is currently in 2019, probably at your hospital and mine? What is a massive transfusion mortality in 2019? It's about, yeah. I, I'll, I'll guess. Yes. I, I, I would say probably around 30 to 35. That's a good guess, 18 to 20%. Okay, we've made huge strides. 
Huge strides. And that's what this talk's going to be about. Let me keep going. Now, if you're a blood banker, and I'm, again, the tongue in cheek here, you don't care about dead people. Dead people, or if I, they, they died, they don't use blood. That's fine. It's not my problem. We showed survivors who do use blood use less blood with the master transfusion protocol. We gave them a lot more stuff up front, specifically the yellow stuff, platelets and plasma, and we got them to stop bleeding quicker. So that cock phase, and here we are celebrating at the AAST, both Juan Duchesne and myself. He is, my, he is my, my equivalent from Puerto Rico that is now at Tulane at Charity Hospital, the great Charity Hospital, which is a, one of the godfathers of trauma centers in New Orleans. He and I present the same damn work at the same meeting, we had never met each other, and we were so excited. I, was, we were, I looked at it, parts of it, we were like, hey, what the hell is he presenting? Well, what the hell is he presenting? Somebody stole my idea. Then we realized there's power in that. Two separate centers have shown the same thing, and that the master transfusion protocols save lives, and that was a huge thing. So getting back to my concept and my discussion during my talk, collaboration is enormous. It's huge. And not only did he showed it in the master transfusion, he showed in the submassive transfusion patient population still benefited from getting that protocol and getting that higher ratio. They still did better in the submassive transfusion. Here's another friend, didn't know anything. He's goofy, tall, big ears. He's from England. He talks funny. And here I am, this redneck from Texas. I meet him. And I realized Terrence O'Keefe's a good dude. And guess what? He's doing the same damn thing. He's doing it at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. He's now uh, the head of uh, division. He's kind of Dr. Collier's uh, counterpart at Augusta. Uh, at the trauma center there. And they showed flat out but by giving a protocol, just by protocolizing the process, they could reduce blood products. And you reduce blood products, you reduce infections, or complications, and you save money. Hospital loves that. So I came back all excited and I was met with a lot of my senior faculty that said, oh, yeah, all right, fine, you're saving lives, you're reducing blood, but phew, you got to be killing them with organ failure. You got to be giving them all these problems, kidney, organ failure, lungs, sepsis, all these infections because you're giving them blood products. But honestly, we had less of those. And why did we have less of those? Because we were giving less blood products with this protocol. Yeah, we were giving more plasma early, more platelets early, but we gave less overall. So we gave them less blood to be exposed to. So it was a win-win. So higher fluids, now we're getting into the other components of it, higher fluids balance ratios. This is, and, and we talked about this earlier, and, and definitely uh, Alice and I talked about this earlier as well. Here's uh, John Holcomb and his true brother in arms that was a PhD basic scientist, Charlie Wade, that came together and really revolutionized, both of them on that initial paper I was showing you, damage control, uh, the resuscitation in, in, in the US and, and across the military especially. And what they did is looked at the different trauma centers and their ratios, and not to get too deep into the the figures here, but they showed that patients bleed to death early, number one, those Kaplan-Meier curves line up pretty similarly, except for the, the separations in that first three hours. And the ratios that do the best are the one to one to one. And you go in a little bit, hone in a little bit more, it's really maybe about two and a half hours that things are happening. Then you go across the other side of the country to Pittsburgh, and now here's Jason Sperry, who's now again the division chief uh, there, he's looking at it. and looking at it in just blunt trauma patients. Remember we talked about, ah, it's penetrating is one thing, blunt's another. Well, he showed just in blunt trauma patients that there was the same figure, the same curves. They're dying early and they're being saved more with a higher ratio of blood product. Then we finally come together with proper, which was a randomized trial of one to one to one versus one to one to two. When I mean that, I mean plasma and platelets in the one to one and then red cells last. So they were giving half of the amount of plasma and platelets in the one to one to two group, we were giving a balance. We were giving a reconstituted whole blood, if you will, okay? 12 centers, 680 enrollment, and we did not find a statistically significant difference in 24 hour mortality for a couple of reasons. And she can chime in later here, but here's what we felt was going on. When we powered proper, we thought, all right, because I showed you how high the mortality was before, the one to one to two group based on historical is gonna be about 30% mortality. One to one to one, it's gonna be about 20 to 25%. Well, they both outperformed it. They both did better than we expected. Because again, the study didn't happen in six months. The planning of this was about three plus years. And so from the time of our concept and everybody getting their big brains in there and designing it and getting the grant to finally rolling this out and taking care of patients and randomizing them, it was a good three years. But what we did see is if you were bleeding to death, not a head injury, but if you were bleeding to death, one to one to one saved your life. 
This is actually the overall Kaplan-Meier curve difference you can see within the separation. But again, if you were in the one-to-one -one group, you wanted you got better hemostasis, so you stopped bleeding quicker, and you saved your life from bleeding to death. Did not save head injuries. Head injuries did not get a benefit from this. Another step, getting rid of that clear stuff. We've known for a while that it causes lung injury if you give too much of that clear stuff. It can cause swelling in the abdomen, which then can hurt the kidneys, getting enough blood supply back to them. All kinds of gut dysmotility. That first paper I showed you from Lobo at the beginning that inspired me at the VA was about gut dysmotility, gut dysfunction. And we know that just getting a difference in, in small amounts of difference in fluids in, in the emergency department, getting like one liter versus three liters can cause major differences. And there's uh, multiple different studies looking at that as well. You look at this, here's Kenji Inaba. He's at L.A. County uh, in, 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 in L.A., sorry. Uh, and he's been there for pretty much his whole career. Uh, and he and I uh, become friends over the years. He's shown patients that end up leaking from their abdominal reanastomosis. We rehook up their colon, their bowel will end up leaking more with just a little bit more fluid than the other group. And so even that early fluid in the ER will figure, will figure into you leaking in that 30 days post-operatively. It's a, or usually it's about seven days, but uh, up to 30 days post-op. And he looked at that and really beat it up and showed that just getting 10 and a half liters in 72 hours puts you at the, one of the highest risks, five-fold higher risk. Now let's go back and put that in perspective. I gave that girl 18 in a six, seven hour period, and the nurses and my colleagues didn't blink at that. Over three days, 10 and a half liters, it's already getting less and it's still a problem. And this is again being in the 2006, 2008 timeframe. Now, as I talked about at the Grand Rounds earlier, the, one of the biggest things is if you believe in something, it ought to go all the way out to the patient, okay? Because in bleeding to death, it happens quickly. So if we believe X is the answer, then X ought to be on the helicopter, in the field, at your EMS, uh, on your rig. It's got to be affected by that. And so we wanted to look at, because we were trying to minimize the fluids, we already were in control. The helicopters were given less. The hospital was given less. Anesthesia is finally coming to give less. How do we prevent them getting a lot of fluid in the field? And this is one of the papers that helped kind of push that. And what we found is no one, no one benefited from getting fluid in the field in this giant national study, this not giant na database. Now again, retrospective, a lot of missing stuff, issues with that, but no one benefited, and only one was not harmed. Am I, correct, am I interpreting that correctly? You know, a good way to, 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 again, within reason, this is harm, this is benefit, and only one person kind of gets not harmed, but not a big benefit. And ISS less than nine, just to tell you guys, that means you probably got a femur fracture and you're showing up on your cell phone calling your mama, I'm hurt, uh, I broke my leg, and that's about it. You're not bleeding to death. You have a femur fracture. Don't get me wrong, it hurts. I don't want a femur fracture myself, but it's not really injured, and that's not the thing that as a trauma surgeon I go run down for. I'm like, yeah, all right, well, call me if you need anything or if they don't have a pulse, you know, so. So back to Juan Duchesne, my, 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 my brother from Puerto Rico. He then pushes it even more on lowering the fluids. We're not going to give, we're going to just hide all the fluids. He took, they used to store big one liter bags in the, in the OR for anesthesia. He got rid of them and got down to 500 bags and 250 bags. You could still physically give 10 liters, but it was going to take you a lot longer and you're going to have to put a lot more effort into doing it. So he did that. And then he also put smaller bags of more concentrated fluid in there called hypertonic saline and showed an improvement. Now, what about that other third part, permissive hypotension? So Baylor, who did that one about no, no fluids all the way to the OR, also did a lower blood pressure in the operating room. And they randomized people to once they got to the operating room, you're going to get a low blood pressure or a, high, high, a normal blood pressure. So a MAP, mean arterial pressure of 50 or mean arterial pressure of 65. You're going to be randomized to one of those arms. And what they found was they lost less blood in the lower mean arterial pressure arm, or the hypotensive resuscitation, and they lost... Less, uh, uh, less blood volume and used less blood products. So win-win uh, uh, on that. But the ROC consortium did a very similar thing, looking at as long as you have a palpable pulse or you're a little bit awake, got a blood pressure above 70, we're not going to touch you. We know your blood pressure is really low, but we're just going to, the only fluid you're going to get is diesel in the EMS rig, and we're going to race to the hospital, right? That's all you're getting. Or we're going to do the normal, and we're going to give you a couple liters of fluid, and drive in, start some other IVs, and do the normal EMS type process. 
And what they found was a huge difference in mortality among blunt trauma patients. These are car crashes, auto pedestrians, motorcycles. In 24 hours, a huge difference in mortality by giving less fluid. Now you bring all those together and apply them to the sickest population there is, which is in our world, in, my, in Dr. Collier's world, damage control laparotomy. And by bringing all those together, all three tenants at our hospital, uh, on the helicopter system exclusively, we were able to control for all that and, and looking at even how acidotic they were and how low their blood pressure and their level of coagulopathy, we still had a two and a half fold increased odds of, of survival with this new concept versus those who didn't practice that concept. But you can't let it in there. And that's part of this, hopefully part of this talk is you, you don't just, it's not a one and done. You gotta keep it going, right? And the Astros are currently struggling to do that. They did one <laughs> World Series high five, they knocked the Yankees out and now they're struggling. They, but, and Houston won't be happy if the Nationals sweep them, all right? Even if they end up losing in seven, which I have game seven tickets, full disclosure, I'm hoping they do kind of string it out a little bit even if they lose. I do wanna to go to game seven World Series, all right, it's a bucket list. You can't be done with that. You gotta mature it, you gotta keep going. And that's what we did. So we dissected it, like CSI dissected this stuff to figure out how we can make our massive transfusion better. Is CSI even still on TV? Am I showing my age? I'm sorry. Um, and the things that we figured we could fix, a lot of them were just, hey, here's some donuts, here's some coffee. Let me talk to you about what you did. I want you. I want to fix this thing. It's called academic detailing in the um, in the drug rep world. Where they come in and kind of schmooze you. So I did that to the anesthesia residents and the ER docs and people like that. But there was one problem that was not their fault. It was us. It was the surgeons. We a lot of people were not activating it in the ER. If you activate it, like Collier and I and a lot of the young faculty at Vandy did, you had an almost threefold higher survival than our other colleagues who were activating it five, 10 minutes later, when they wheeled into the operating room, oh yeah, better activate the protocol. Activating it just in that five to 10 minute difference, geographically about the same area, increased likelihood of survival by activating it earlier, or three-fold decrease in, uh, in survival, however you wanna look at it. So early recognition is good. How the heck do we make it early? How do we pick up? How can I convince these faculty that aren't me and Collier and Bill Reardon and a few of the others to activate it faster so we can save some more lives? And so I got some people, and again, I'm talking about collaborating here. I've got a fellow here, Tim Nunez. I've got a, a surgical resident, MPH, who went into surgical oncology later. She's actually at University of Michigan. And then another trauma fellow there. I got their help and recruited them figure out how to best do this. And so what we did, we looked at all the scores that were out there. This was one of them. And even if I tell you what the variables are, I can't do this in the middle of the night. I didn't have the ability to pull up an app and I was pretty sure no one was gonna tap on their Blackberry at the time to this in input this information and figure this out. What's the other option? Well, there's a McLaughlin score that was out there. All right, maybe we could do that. It works. These are both very powerful scores. They work very well, but at 3 a.m., you're just not gonna be using this. It's just not gonna happen. So we said, well, what do you use? Oh, I use this. Well, what do you use? I use this. And our statistician and pH person puts this in and comes up with these four, these four variables and then runs the, the curves and goes, it looks almost as good as the other two scores and it's a hell of a lot easier to remember, are they hypotensive? Are they tachycardic? Do they have positive fluid on their ultrasound? And are they a penetrating mechanism? If they have two of those, they get a massive transfusion. So it's a lot easier to predict. But we didn't stop there. We went and did a multi-center trial, looking at other hospitals across the country, and looked at it and showed that it did pretty well at those different hospitals. Now, one of the most powerful things was ultrasound to see if they had fluid, which in a trauma patient is blood. And what, what we found is that the better you were or the more you did, the better your, your performance was. And the lowest performing ultrasound center was Parkland, and they did, it performed the worst, but still performed pretty well. So now fast forward, and again, this is collaboration. There's Brian Kim, a former fellow of mine. This is Martin Zelensky, uh, a, a, a colleague, but they're both at Mayo. Brian trained with Dr. Collier and I at Vanderbilt as a fellow. And they went back and said, well, I wonder how the ABC score would work in rural Minnesota. We're not gonna have a lot of gunshot wounds, so the penetrating's probably gonna be out. And now it's down to these three factors. And what they did, they looked at it, and they found it performed very well. It was accurate about 84 to 87% of the time. and it called it, over called it about 47% of the time. But you can always send stuff back. 
But what it didn't do is it didn't miss people that ended up getting a massive transfusion, which is more important. So the under triage is the term, was less than 5%, which is super important because you don't want to be racing for it later. And this continues. So that was, a, that was years and years ago. Now this is a more recent one we did, looking to make things even better. Every minute counts. How can we make things better? We looked at a randomized trial and how quickly the trauma surgeon activated the protocol, made that call that I was talking about, to get the cooler moving. The time to get the cooler to the bedside was a huge determinant of how well that patient did. In fact, controlling for how bad they were injured, controlling regardless of whether they got one-to-one -one ratio or one-to-one-to-two -one -to ratio, every 60 second delay in getting that cooler to the bedside increased their odds of mortality by 5%, every 60 second delay, controlling for all the other factors. And again, you can't just leave it there. You've got to expand it. You've got to continue to mature it. This is Zaid Radawan. Anybody guess what he went into? Orthopedic surgery. <laughs> he only had about five or six papers with me. But he ended up working and uh, just went back to Houston, actually finished his fellowship in sports medicine. And we worked on a thawed plasma protocol to get plasma to the bedside quicker, to finally get it into our ER. We had red cells. Let's get the yellow stuff and not have to wait for the blood bank to run it down three minutes down the hall. And by doing that, we reduced the amount of patients that actually needed a, a massive transfusion. We reduced the amount of red cells that were transfused, the amount, the amount of plasma, the amount of platelets. So we saved the hospital money and saved lives. Again, not randomized, but something to think about. But if you believe it, let's get it as close to the patient as possible, right? So Jason Sperry's group out of Pittsburgh did just this with red cells, showing that whether it was a scene transport or whether it was a transfer from another hospital, just simply putting blood products on the helicopter was associated, not causative, was associated with an improvement in survival. The Zel Zelensky and Brian Kim, who I showed you the picture drinking uh, some fine bourbons with at the bar, showed me that they could do that with plasma as well and reduced the, um, the, the, the mortality from that. We put both of those on our helicopters in Houston and showed a very similar thing that controlling for all those factors, being on life flight with red cells and plasma gave you a better outcome, was associated with a better outcome than being on any of the other helicopter services. And then more recently, uh, the person I talked about earlier, Jason Sperry at Pittsburgh, has put this one out, a multi-center randomized controlled trial showing that patients that, um, uh, that, that receive plasma versus saline do better. And not only do they do better, uh, their, their survival and their 30-day, not just their early survival, but their 30-day survival is improved versus our standard of care. And these were plasma, some of them just got a unit in the field and still randomized trial did better. Plasma, amazing concept. A lot of, lot of fibrinogen in it, a lot of clotting factors, great acid base buffer, 50 times the buffering capacity of any other product on the planet, except for, except for pl uh, pig plasma. Pig plasma is just as good. The buffering capacity on both sides, alkaline or acid challenge, is amazing. It's also an amazing volume expander. It gets that blood volume back up without a bunch of red cells that, again, carry oxygen. It's important, but the volume expansion is important too. And they restore from, and this is, we've shown this in basic science research, they restore the vascular endothelium, the endothelial glycocalyx. They restore that, and we know the endothelium is not the lining of some benign sewer pipe transporting blood from one part of the body to the other. It is reactive, active, interactive, sometimes angry, into part of the clotting cascade and inflammation. It's got a lot of stuff going on. You expose the endothelial glycocalyx to hypoxia or to, to an insult of hypotension shock, you lose that glycocalyx. You lose that glycocalyx, it gets leakier, you lose volume, you, you get interruption of the normal clotting cascade, the, dark, the things that have, from a biologic evolutionary standpoint have kept us from dying when we were cavemen and women are now being lost because of the fluids we're giving them. Plasma has shown in basic science, bench research, to restore this stuff. And this was done at our hospital with cooperation with our PhD group. So what are the next steps? So if you steal a car, what do you do with the car? You chop it up and sell it for parts. You don't sell the car. You sell the car, you don't make as much money as chopping up and sell it for parts. Well, the blood bank did this, and that, they didn't do it because it, they're trying to make cash. But they broke it up and, and did us a disservice. And let me go into that real quick, and I'll, I'll wrap up here. Hope Blood was the go-to product for patients that were bleeding to death all the way from World War II to Vietnam. But then the blood bankers got really cool and really inventive and figured out, we can break up this whole blood, and now i got a red cell I can give my anemic patient, and a thing of plasma I can give my coagulopathic patient, and oh, the bone marrow patient, here's some platelets. So from a public health standpoint, they could serve more people. I'm, my tongue-in-cheek about them doing this for money, it's not about that. It did make them more money, but it wasn't just about that. It was a greater health good. But not one time did they study to say, 
these three products are as good as the whole blood in patients that are bleeding to death. They never studied to see if they should do it for bleeding to death patients. And again, that's only probably five to 6% of their population that they're serving. Most people are not bleeding to death. They just need a little bit of blood product, but they never studied it. In fact, the studies that we used in ATLS to teach people how to care for trauma patients showed, oh, you don't need extra fluid. You don't need extra plasma and platelets. And that's how we practiced for two decades. That's how I was practicing when I flat out helped kill that girl. And what was the reason? If you go back and read the actual study, not the abstract, you read the full paper, they go, crystalloid safe while you're waiting on whole blood. And they say that within it. Until you're waiting for whole blood, you're waiting for it to show up, you can give them some crystalloid. One liter, one liter, one liter. The other studies go, you don't need platelets and plasma extra. You're right, counts as study. Oh, by the way, it's only 20 patients that he made this hypothesis and changed the way we transfuse trauma patients. But in those 20 patients, he says, you don't need it. But he was using whole blood. He wasn't just using red cells, he was using whole blood. And in addition to whole blood, you don't need those extras. So go 30 years later, and we've got all these products. So here's what happened. And you were t I asked at the beginning, how did we get this stupid? Right? Here's what we, how we got stupid. We gave them these fluids because we thought we could because we didn't read the damn paper, we just read the abstract, they pulled away whole blood and broke it up into parts. We started leaving patients open abdomens to save their lives because they had a bunch of injuries, and then we couldn't get them closed. And we, instead of going, wait, why can't we get them closed? We go, let's fix a way to bridge things. Let's put mesh in. Let's do this. We didn't pay attention to all of these different things going on in the middle of the night. We were also doing that PA catheter directed, lots of fluid resuscitation. The military came and saved us again from a civilian resuscitation standpoint. They started running out of blood in these deployed settings and had to go to get whole blood donors from the doctors, nurses, and, 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 and soldiers that weren't injured to donate to their, to their brothers and sisters in arms. And they anecdotally go, this is amazing. They stop bleeding once we give them whole blood. This is amazing. So they go to study it. But they can't study it because the military doesn't do randomized controlled trials. They, it is deemed unethical. So they gave us money in Houston to do a randomized controlled trial. And this is what we did. We did a randomized controlled trial of whole blood versus one to one to one. Unfortunately, in the process of doing this, and we had to do what's called EFIC, exception from informed consent, get community consent, and then start emergently with these products. The head hematologist with the Department of Defense said, you have to leuco reduce all your blood. You can't just give one, uh, the red cells being leuco reduced coming out of the blood bank. Even the whole blood has to do it. Unfortunately, the whole blood filter to reduce it destroys the platelets. There's now a newer one that doesn't destroy the platelets that's expensive, but it wasn't even out on the market at the time. So we were forced, forced as we're getting ready to roll out the study, to change our blood product from whole blood to modified whole blood. And so in addition to getting those six of whole blood, we had to chase it with a little apheresis platelet, which was not, not, not our point, and that, that, that hurt us quite a bit. We also, and we talked, I've talked to several people today, I've talked to, uh, to, to several of, of your mentors as well as the groups this morning. What also hurt us was, 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 was having to, to break, these, break these products up and roll it out. And more importantly, when you're doing a bleeding study and you're doing it so early before you have CAT scans, it's hard to know if that patient has a head injury. And the head injuries totally destroyed the study. Head injuries totally destroyed proper. Head injuries make big impacts on bleeding to death studies. Unfortunately, in head bleed studies, in brain injury studies, half the patients that get enrolled in a, in a rapid fashion like this without a CAT scan, half of them are just drunk or high. They're not really have a head injury. But because their level of consciousness is so low, they are assigned by the medics and nurses in the field and sometimes doctors that they got a head injury and you don't know any better, so they get randomized. And so that always throws in a loop of confusion. So we wanted to look at, was it more hemostatic? And to cut to the chase, after getting rid of an a priori agreed upon uh, 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 bad non-survivable head injuries documented by our neurosurgeons, we looked at those that didn't have a non-survivable head injury. And when you looked at that subgroup, we showed a reduction in red cell, plasma, and I would argue platelet transfusions uh, and overall blood products in that group if they got whole blood versus one to one to one. So it was more hemostatic. You use less blood products and you got bleeding controlled quicker. In fact, that actually translated into something I showed you in those Kaplan-Meier curves. Remember it was three hours was pretty much the window that everybody died or didn't die from bleeding? Whole blood actually extended it out to almost 12 hours. So they still died, but we were fixing them better 
with whole blood. We were getting control of it a little better. A lot of that driver was probably some of the head injuries in that group, but again, it was a lot better than only living 1.9 hours. This got a lot of attention, and the military started running with it. In fact, the Department of Defense in 2016 rolled out a whole blood program for first their, their special forces, SEALs, then their Army Rangers, and then they extended it out into more of a, a robust program where patients were getting whole blood. And they finally had come up with and tested low anti-B and low anti-A antibody titers to make group O a universal donor and instead of having to do type specific. And this is a great paper from the San Antonio group doing just the same or talking about the concept of it. This is before they actually implemented it. And then we looked at it and, and investigated it and did a good review based on our randomized trial and decided we were going to do this. We're going to do this because, you know what, if I give whole blood, I give one donor's exposure for one unit. If I give you one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, that's three donors because somebody donated the red cells, somebody probably donated the plasma, somebody donated the platelets. They weren't all the same donor. So it's already safer. So let's do that. So we put it in our ER and we put it on our helicopters. It's about a 21-day shelf life, RH positive, RH negative, low antibody titers to B and A. And again, not leukoreduced. We still are doing local reduction because we are in control of this study rather than the other direction. So this is the study that came out uh, from, from one of our med students. This is actually a Duke med student that I was talking about with one of your mentors earlier. Uh, they do five years at Duke, and he spent a year with us between his third and fourth year and came and did um, uh, a year with us and did research. And this is one of his projects. And we looked at the safety profile of this by putting it on the helicopters and putting it in the emergency department. Looked at about 300 units to about almost 200 patients and compared those who got emergency red cells and emergency plasma rather than emergency whole blood. And what we found out is that pretty evenly matched, albeit the, the whole blood patients seem to be a non-randomized trial, prospective observational, seem to be getting a little bit, they were a little bit sicker. They are a little more anatomically injured. And that probably goes with the fact that you put this type of product on a helicopter and the medic is looking and going, this one looks sick, I'm going to give them some blood. This one looks really sick. I'm going to give them some whole blood. And so there's some, there's some problems with bias there that make prospective observational not a good randomized, not as good as a randomized trial. And you look at this, and this all further supports that. The whole blood patients at the scene were more, uh, uh, had, a, had a, a, a higher heart rate, so they were more in shock, lower blood pressure, lower diastolic as well. And it were more likely to get intubated, get their airway taken over by the medics in the field. So they were a sicker physiologic and anatomic group in the field. They arrived to us with lower blood pressures as well, and worse uh, uh, coagula or quite not coagula, but worse uh, base deficit shock. So their pH was lower, their base to excess was worse, their lactate was worse. However, after we resuscitated in the ER and they got matched products they left the ER with l using less products. They got less post-ED transfusions. In addition, with the exception of bilirubin actually being better, their, hemo their hemolysis, their hemolytic issues from a laboratory standpoint were better in that, in that whole blood arm or the same. These are just more of those potassium, creatinine, uh, PF ratios, that, again, more of the same. And then if you look at 30-day survival in a, in a, in a, in a multivariate logistic regression, controlling for all the things that we talked about before, you had a two-fold higher survival in the whole blood arm and about a 50% reduction in post-ED blood products. So using less blood products and having a better survival, again, knowing this is not a randomized controlled trial. So again, these are some interesting things coming out of the military, and then we've shown some safety to it, not generalizable, single center, and again, whether or not if you go lower on your antibody titers, is it even safer? Maybe, but we haven't shown that. And again, not randomized, so you had some flight team and position uh, bias in, in included in that. Now, one last thing before we stop and I open up to questions. This is important because uh, we use rapid, rapid infusers to get fluid and, and blood products into patients faster that are literally dying, not just getting blood, but the ones that are dying. And so this has been shown for quite some time as a great way to do it. However, that, those rapid infusers have a filter on them that kills the fibrinogen and the platelets. And sometimes you'll see no platelets, no fibrinogen, uh, but this one says just no platelets. And as I'm rolling out and I'm giving the rah-rah speech to the nurses, we've got our first patient coming in, I'm going to hang the first unit of whole blood at our hospital. I'm so excited. One of the very smart nurses goes, didn't you say it was awesome because of the plasma and the platelets? And I go, yeah. Well, I can't give it through here. It says no platelets. So here's our translational moment. We go, and there have been many of these. This is just one I want to end with. I said, all right, well, go ahead and give it, and then I'll go study it, and I'll let you be on the paper. So that's what we did. 
uh, except she did more than just that. She actually came up to the base, the bench, up to the, up, up to the med school, to the lab from the hospital, set up the Belmont infuser, and ran it, and then did other blood filters that weren't on an infuser, and we collected the data, and our bench PhD team ran it and, and, and ran our data for us. So it's still in the Belmont precautions. Don't give it with platelets or, or plasma. So here's what we did. We had Zaza, who's uh, actually, again, full circle, one of my fellows in Houston, uh, looking for a job. He's on a J-1 visa. He needs to go to certain underserved areas. And now he's going to work with what was my first trauma fellow at Vander, or my first trauma resident at Vanderbilt, Chris Anderson, who's now the chairman at the University of Mississippi. And so he's going to go work with his group and several other former Vandy people uh, at, in Jackson. So Zaza did this study with me, along with the, the nurse and our, and our PhD collaborators, Dr. Wade Cardenas and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Willa Wang. And what we found is, yes, it does trap platelets. Platelets are all the same size. Some of them are small, some of them are large. It's trapping those larger ones. So it's dropping your platelet count by going through from a baseline, just drip, 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 or a filter, or a pressure bag that you may see, or these Belmonts that rapidly transfuse it. It absolutely drops the platelets. However, when you look at multi-plate uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the basic science lab, you'll see that the, re the function of those platelets is retained. They're actually able to stay functional, and you're kind of getting rid of the, the dumb ones, the ones that aren't working very well, the platelets, okay? Um, yeah, there's probably some better words. I was getting ready to see something else and I stopped myself since it's being recorded. I get a rapid tag. We looked at those two. No difference over time. Everything, it does okay. It's not destroying the platelet function. Uh, and again, MA is the, uh, one of the ways you measure platelets. You can see that drop just a little bit, but not significant. And then finally, we looked at thrombin generation, that burst of thrombin, that burst of clot formation. Uh, and this is the gold standard called CAT, or Calibrated Automated Thrombogram. And we found it actually got better. Perhaps the, 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 bio, the biomedical engineers in here can understand it, but perhaps it going through that system and that agitator and going through activated the clotting factors better, and it actually formed a faster and stronger and longer standing clot with going through the Belmont. So these are some things we walked away with, and we were happy. We presented our data at a, at a, science, at a basic science meeting, uh, and we're, we're very happy waiting for this to finally get published. So it's critically important to be collaborative and to use that way and get those PhD collaborations other collaborations uh, in statistics and epidemiology and other, other fields. So I'll wrap things up from my little Forrest Gumpism here. Uh, damage crew resuscitation, again, three things. Whole blood-based resuscitation, limiting the amount of, of clear stuff we give them, and letting the blood pressure be a little bit low so we don't pop the clot until we can get some, some surgical instruments on it and some suture. It begins as close to the patient's point as possible. The ratios matter. Whole blood seems safe. Early detection is key. No matter what you believe in, do it early and get it close to the patient's bedside. Resuscitation has dramatically changed. I took you from a 65% when we started, 65% down to 50, down to about 30, to 25, down to about 20. We questioned things that didn't make sense. We questioned authority. I got in trouble a lot. I went to timeout a lot. I finally had to change locations to go practice somewhere else. But we also look to the past for answers. Sometimes the people in the past were doing things right, sometimes they weren't. Sometimes now you, with a better knowledge, can add to their knowledge. And again, this is one of my favorite quotes about you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, because there's been a lot of giants of resuscitation we've built on and, and, and made ourselves better, made our patients better off. And this is one of the things that guides me in my life, knowing that I haven't done it first. I was, this isn't me just coming up with some cool stuff. Cotton really has built on and I did the research to build on what has been done before. But probably more appropriately to my lifestyle is this one, which is if, you know, if, it's, if you're going to fight, fight like a, th like a third monkey in line for Noah's Ark and baby, it's starting to rain. So I appreciate your time and your efforts. These are my six kiddos uh, who I'll be uh, racing back to tonight. Yes, same baby mama, same baby daddy. Um, <laughs> but uh, they all look alike. So if she's having an affair, she's having the same guy. Um, <laughs> but I appreciate your time. I look forward to any questions, comments, feedback. Uh, don't report me to HR. And I look forward to any, any, any questions from the audience. Thank you, guys. Yes, sir. So 
So there was a study that came out of Penn about um, using margin based oppressive yes. cutting down the yep. volume. What, what are your thoughts on future directions? So I, th I think it's a fantastic agent, and I will tell you clinically, for the last several years, I've used uh, vasopressin. Dr. Uh, Collier actually wrote, wrote a paper on it showing some imp increased mortality with its use. But I think if you start with it early, it has, um, it has effects that we use it actually in uh, bleeding cirrhotics. In patients with cirrhosis of the liver that have bleeding from portal hypertension, some patients, they will actually use it as one of our frontline agents as vasopressin or arginine vasopressin to get control. So I do think it has a place. I think when it comes in as a rescue, which is what I kind of thought in some of the stuff with, with Dr. Collier's paper that we had done at Vandy, is it comes in too late. When The last thing to come in is going to get blamed for everything, and I think it doesn't do well. If you do it early, I think it has a place. So I think vasopressin more than epi or norepi because it's working on that splanchnic circulation and clamping down and helping with the blood loss. So I think it does have a place, and I was, I was excited to see that study. Yes, sir. Uh, so I was reading on the Red Cross that the shelf life for non lupin reduced whole blood yeah. is 35 days, yeah. but the modified whole blood is five days. I was wondering, so is it the lupin reduction that does that? And you also mentioned that um, there's a new type of lupin reduction that doesn't destroy the platelets. Yes. extend the shelf life? So we don't know if it extends the shelf life yet, uh, but get back to the modified. The modified was, be, uh, was out of practicality that um, they were trying, because they were sending the blood back after five days so they could pull the red cells out and use it longer. That's why it really had five days. It actually could go out longer if you were just looking at the red cells, but it lost a lot of the other, other components to it. Um, 35 days is, is, is a reasonable shelf life. We use um, 21 at our, at our shop. In fact, we just did worked with the same collaborators that we did uh, uh, with the PhD uh, bench people, showing that it probably ought to be even as low as 14 days to really get all the platelet and clotting balance. It probably ought to be about 14 days, but currently we're doing 21 just to be on the safer side so it doesn't get too old because there's some issues with oxygen delivery and stuff as the blood gets older. So. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Um, kind of springboarding off of your question, yeah. um, with this switch uh, and the, the obvious data that whole yeah. blood has all these benefits, how do you think that will affect moving forward how we work with blood banks and blood shortages and rural medicine and all that? Yeah, yeah, so that's, well, so if, if, if you think about it, you can, with one unit, uh, maybe get a little more bang for your buck out of each unit. So that has a benefit to it. I think we're going to have to be smarter, and we're continuing to do that. And some of it's been held up in the FDA, but there are products like freeze-dried platelets and freeze-dried plasma that people are working on, which have shelf lives of a good year. And you can carry that in, a, in the back of a, of a paramedic a truck, pull it off the back of the truck, shake it up, reconstitute it with, with, uh, with sterile water or saline, and hang it to the patient with good coagulation factors retained. That's still not approved. It's in Europe. Uh, and it's in the military right now, but it's not being used in U.S. civilian settings right now. But that'll be probably the, not the, uh, the game changer for rural medicine and rural care, uh, as well as places that are just smaller. It'll be amazing. I look, I look, I look forward to it. It's going to be, it's going to be huge. Right now, though, whole blood is still reasonable, and if you can get it from your blood providers, it's a fantastic product with a good shelf life. Somebody, else? yeah. Go ahead. led to this whole thing between the 1950s and the 2000s? Yeah, so I don't blame it on the researchers. I blame it on the guys and girls that read your papers, honestly, because all the, a lot of that evidence is there. It was just misinterpreted. I would encourage researchers to make sure that the people reading your stuff read past the abstract. I mean, honestly, several of those things that guided trauma care for two decades in that ATLS book were because they didn't read the full paper, they read the abstract and go, oh, okay, no more, no more whole blood, we're just gonna do platelets, no more platelets, no more plasma, just fluids are good because we misread the paper. So that's one thing is to hopefully work closely. So that's one thing is to collaborate closely with your MD partners so that they understand what you're doing and you understand their needs as well. And that's what I am blessed, I was talking to her, I am so blessed to be where I am, where I've got now a young, young PhD uh, coagulation expert, Jessica Cardenas, who's taking the place of Charlie Wade, who will retire soon, and she and I are as buddy-buddy as we can get. We go to meetings together, we, she comes to my office and, and we work through stuff, she'll take call with me, go to the ICU, figure, listen to me, what I'm complaining about, and go, all right, let's talk about that a little bit more, and let's, let's fix it. So I think, you guys going to our arena and us going to your arena. Because I, 
I don't pipette, I don't do all, I don't run cat myself or multiplate, but I can tell you how to do it because I've watched them do it and I get a respect for that and I get involved. You've got to, they, they've got to get in the trenches with you and we've got to, you've got to get in there with us to get that collaborative thing. And as I've shown, much more pragmatic, much more reasonable, much more bulletproof, if you will, trials. And then again, finally, make sure they're, they're, they're listening to what you're saying. They're not just looking at an odds ratio in a table. They're taking away more than just the abstract or a sexy table. They're taking away what really went on. And I think they've really got to understand what you guys are putting out and vice versa so it doesn't get misinterpreted. This is exactly what happened there. Because a more crucial eye or even a hardcore statistician could have beaten up a lot of those papers even if they did read past the abstract. So there's a lot of junk science that went on that was just put out uh, because it made sense at the time. So a lot of communication and a lot of collaboration is probably the way to take care of that in a way that both of you guys could serve the patient better in the end. Yes, sir. Carry three knives? Uh, no, seriously. Uh, so, so I think I didn't, uh, yes, I was successful, but it wasn't, um, I, I wouldn't encourage the way I did it uh, purely. I mean, there were some ways to do it. There are some ways to collaborate. But the things I did right is I collaborated with people outside of my comfort zone and outside of what I was doing, which was surgeons. And I got data to support that what I was doing was right. I wish I would have been less, you're wrong, and more, hey, I think I'm right on this. I think what I'm doing is better, not what you're doing sucks. Which, let, I'm flat out honest, I have, that's why my na nickname is ABC or Angry Brian Cotton. So, um, <laughs> I, I wish I would have been healthier and better about it uh, with it than, and told them that I think I got a better way to do it, rather than, again, your way sucks. So I think there's ways to do that. There's ways to have a good reference library and have good, if you're going to surgery, pediatrics, whatever, have someone outside of your field that supports it. And you wanna know how else you do it? Which is the entire shock article in my entire grand rounds was because of PhD work. Using their work, and that was finally to answer your question, that was one of the other ways I pushed me forward was I took the full paper, not the abstract, and put the full paper on those PowerPoints in that grand rounds and go, we're wrong and this is why. If you read the full paper, X, Y, and Z, and by going back and reading those full basic science papers, I could explain why they had misinterpreted what they had misinterpreted, you know. So yeah, there are m much more productive ways to do it and people skills and yada, 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 which I can't teach you, but Dr. Collier can. He's, he's HPC, he's happy Brian Collier, and I'm angry Brian Cotton. HPC, ABC, so. Thank you guys, thank you so much. <laughs>